last two years have seen the miraculous birth and growth of the rescue movement. By the middle of 1990, there have been over 40,000 arrests as people have sought to save children from being killed by abortion and their mothers from being exploited. Hundreds of babies have been saved from death as a result of this courageous stand. Among those arrested often leading the way have been hundreds of clergy. This explosion of Christian activism is unprecedented in American history. But this wave of activism has come with a cost. Besides being arrested and often jailed in one city after another, nonviolent, peaceful, praying rescuers are being met with police brutality. Brutality on a scale that has not been seen in the United States for over 20 years. Injuries have ranged from having mace sprayed in the face of rescuers, including a two-year-old baby, broken bones, the near death of at least three grown men, and pregnant women losing their babies in miscarriage. However, this brutality has been all but ignored by the national media. That in itself is a disgrace and an outrage. The brutality you are about to see is fortunately not in every city. Much of the footage you will see was shot by pro-lifers on the scene with home video cameras. The brutality began in Atlanta, Georgia in October of 1988, and these tactics were soon exported to other cities such as Los Angeles. 800 praying pro-lifers were descended on by nearly 500 police, many on horses and many wearing riot gear. All day long, the police systematically brutalized people, resulting in many injuries, including broken bones. The police were astounded at how much pain the rescuers were able to endure. In a sworn statement, Captain Patrick E. McKinley wrote, Pain for many of the demonstrators is a catharsis for past failure to take action against abortion. Therefore, the demonstrators have an unusual capacity to withstand pain. With this unique ability to withstand pain comes the possibility of injury since a greater degree of pain is required to induce compliance by the arrestee. Frustrated with the courage and stamina of the rescuers, the LAPD decided to increase the pain. On June 10, 1989, they used nunchucks on the rescuers. This is an illegal martial arts weapon, and merely possessing one in California is a felony. To be attacked with one is assault with a deadly weapon. Never before in the history of America have nunchucks been used on non-violent protesters. This is the gruesome sight of what happened. The police, in unprovoked cruelty, wrapped the nunchucks around Michael Hausman's arm and broke it. When lawyers went to federal judge Tashima to request he order the police to cease using them, he denied the request, saying in so many words that pro-lifers could not prove they were in any danger. I can't tell you what it's like to be lying on the ground with police officers on, on, on a top of you using all sorts of torture holes to make you walk. You can't walk even if you, were, you wanted to walk. And, and their sole intent is to torture you. Uh, and, and then listening to the screams of the people as somebody gets a bloody nose. And, and as I would look up, there are these two deep rows of police officers. Beyond them, standing on cars and on a wall, were just throngs of, of, of uh, pro-death people screaming for our blood. And if somebody got a bloody nose, they'd scream even louder and chanting blasphemous chants. I offered no resistance whatsoever and uh, they brought me to the middle of the street and uh, threw me down into the asphalt. I had one officer on each hand. I had an officer holding a foot and twisting my ankle. I had another officer standing on my back and uh, doing knee drops into my back. I mean, they could pick you up by all four limbs and walk you away, or they could just simply drag you by two arms or two legs, or they could carry you away on stretchers, or, you know, any number of things, but it just seems very excessive, and it seems like they're, you know, determined to do that because they don't want us in their town. But, you know, we can't let that stop us. A few weeks after the, this treatment I received at the hands of the LAPD, 
Um, I miscarried uh, my ninth child and I have no history of miscarriage and the medical opinion I have is that the probable cause was the excessive and violent use of nunchucks and uh, the plastic straps for an excessively long time. But those things uh, are the probable cause of the miscarriage of my child. And the Fourth Amendment says that no citizen of the United States shall be subject to unreasonable search or seizure. It has been a right that has protected us. This right is being watered down at this time to the point of uselessness to peaceful, nonviolent demonstrators who happen to bring their social reform to the city of Los Angeles. On June 17, 1989, rescuers arrived at the Summit Women's Center in West Hartford, Connecticut at about 8 o'clock in the morning and began entering the abortuary to prevent children from being killed. The police arrived, removed their name tags, badges, and began their cruelty. They quickly arrested four members of the media, seizing and destroying notes, video film, and camera film. They wanted no evidence of their brutality. When the police arrived and they began to make preparations to make arrests, they brought in city buses and they brought them up to the doors and they brought a patrol car in and all the policemen went to the back of the patrol car and they all threw their identifications and their badges into the trunk and took out riot sticks, which was totally unprofessional behavior. When you bring out riot sticks, it's usually because you expect to see some serious opposition. So you put on helmets and you put on face masks and you carry shields. These policemen were bareheaded because they knew they weren't going to get any resistance from the other side. Uh, it was excruciating pain, I think I have to tell you that. It was, uh, uh, well, we've been in Atlanta and others and, uh, you know, they got rough, but we expected that because that's all, that's a consequence of what we do, you know. But here it was calculated torture and, and the policemen were enjoying the pain. They laughed at the, the people screaming and all of us screaming, all of grown men, men, mature men. You couldn't help but scream. Uh, what happened was when the, when the two nightsticks squeezed on the wrists, they cut off the nerve ends and uh, the flow of blood and your hands swelled up to almost twice the size and they turned black. So, uh, and the, the constant movement of that, uh, those uh, scissor, the scissor effects, the two vices on your wrist was just excruciating. They immediately started to hyperflex my hands so far that my hands touched my wrists and they carried me like that and I heard everything crack and everything go and I knew at that point that something had been broken. It didn't matter whether you were a woman, a man, an old person, it didn't matter what your age, sex or anything, that they were just there, they were going to brutalize everybody and I think probably to the women more particularly that they were very angry that they couldn't get a young woman like myself to walk, and I could tell that it was a pride issue. They tell me I stopped breathing for an excess of two minutes, and Father Westland couldn't find a pulse for an excess of one minute. Um, I believe there were some 18 rescuers, all male, up in the cell, and I cell area up there. It's in a semicircle. It's monitored by one-way video cameras and two-way audio, and they all called for for doctors. I am also led to believe that there are two EMTs on call at the police station at all times. When I say on call, I mean downstairs on the first floor. No one responded. Not by coming, not by speaking. No one responded at all. Father Westland administered CPR, and by the grace of God, my heart started beating again. Like that. The only thing a police officer has to back him up in the use of force is he may use, under Connecticut law, that force and only that force that is necessary to achieve legitimate police objectives, legitimate law enforcement objectives. When he crosses over the line to use illegitimate force, then he himself becomes a criminal. The most outrageous abuse to date has come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On March 11, 1989, 120 rescuers intervened at the Allegheny Reproductive Health Center. Because of police misconduct, all rescuers became passively limp through the whole arrest and booking procedure. The women were separated from the men, 
and taken to the Allegheny County Jail. Once in the custody of the county jail guards, unbelievable things took place. Rosanna Weissert is the attorney of record for those women. They were verbally abused by the officers, not just uh, profanity, but comments on the size of their breasts and their condition and what they were going to do with them. They were variously threatened with rape by the guards, with sodomy, with being thrown naked into the prison cells. The women told me that they could actually hear the prisoners. They couldn't tell what they were saying, but they were hooting and howling. And one woman who's a, a grandmother, she has uh, three children who have served in the service and uh, can't believe that this happened to her. She was threatened with rape by the guards if she didn't walk up the stairs. And they were in mortal fear. As I noticed when I was being dragged in, there were men in a holding pen. They were prisoners. They were in a holding pen and they could see that this all happening. Us being dragged in and being dragged up the steps. And when I was being dragged to get my mug shot taken, they had pulled my blast over my head, so my whole breast was exposed. As we were being drugged up, uh, the warden, Kosakovich, was kicking a few of the women. One guard picked me up by my bra, and he drug me up the stairs, and by that, I was totally exposed, and I couldn't, like, pull them down because my hands were behind my back. So they drug me up five flights of stairs by my bra. There was one girl that was a couple beds over, and she was unconscious. And she came up before me, so I didn't know what happened to her. But she was passed out, and we kept going over trying to bring her to. We thought if she'd hear a familiar voice or something. And they wouldn't let us comfort her. They wouldn't let us go near her. They kept telling us, get back on your beds. And it was, it was just like a nightmare. The atrocities in Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, West Hartford, and other cities have prompted the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to ask the FBI and the Justice Department to begin an investigation into various law enforcement agencies. William Allen is the guiding force behind these actions. We have not to this point seen uh, very much in the way of remorse from municipal officials about the treatment rescuers have received. When they have spoken at all, they have seemed rather to condemn the rescuers and to excuse the policemen than to speak regretfully about some of the violent incidents that we have witnessed. One of the gifts to America from the civil rights movement, from the trials, the struggles, and the sufferings of black people has been the consensus that nonviolent social protest is acceptable. Uh, that was not established until the civil rights movement. Selma, Alabama is a high point in that struggle, and people paid dearly to win that price. And I can understand, I suppose, where those who went through the trials of the 1960s somehow would come to think that they were their own trials and perhaps maybe they are the only ones who should profit by it. But that's a mistake. It's a great mistake. But what was won in the struggle for black rights was a gift to the United States, not a gift just to black people. And this consensus that protects nonviolent social protest must be respected today because we're going to need it again. It's not going to end here. Actions against pro-life rescuers crossed sacred boundaries on June 11, 1989, when police invaded a Sunday worship service at New Creation Community Church in Chesapeake, Virginia, for the purpose of serving notices to pro-life church members named in a $1.3 million lawsuit by the Hillcrest Abortion Clinic. We actually recognized that there would come a day when we might face a circumstance such as this. I would never thought it would happen as it has happened, uh, police coming into a service and stopping it. Never thought anything like that could happen in our land. It has. On the one hand, I'm shocked by it, and on the other hand, I I'm not. According to the lawsuit filed by the church, armed police officers violated three constitutional amendments and six Virginia laws when they blocked the church driveway with police squad cars, detained and demanded identification from individuals outside the church building, recorded license plates of vehicles in the church parking lot to obtain the owner's names, detained an individual from entering a prayer room inside the church building, forced worshipers to file through a checkpoint as they left the church building, and used physical restraint and intimidation tactics to compel church members to identify themselves. I feel that we as a church have the responsibility to hold our city officials, to hold our government officials accountable. On the one hand, I certainly want to minister in the kindness of Christ. Yet on the other hand, it's, there's such a responsibility for us to be like Christ, even in, in holding people accountable. 
uh, justice is, is necessary. God is merciful, but yet he's just. As the scripture says, well, I believe God's looking for the church today uh, to, to seek justice, to uphold justice. And so I feel a responsibility now as a result of what occurred Sunday to, to ensure that justice uh, uh, is realized in this matter, justice for the church. Injustice has been found not only in the streets with police or with prison guards, but also in courts with judges and prosecutors. Sentences and rulings have been handed down that are truly tyrannical. Judges have imposed huge fines or harsh jail sentences to good, decent citizens whose only crime was that they were trying to stop murder. Huge lawsuits have been filed to harass and intimidate rescuers. Abortuaries and city governments have used RICO statutes which were designed for racketeers and mobsters against pro-lifers. It's obscene, uh, many of the sentences that they give us in Atlanta, talking about $2,000 fines and two years in jail for a misdemeanor for sitting out in front of a door. Where else would you see somebody else sitting in front of a door and getting two years in jail to block a door? It's obscene. One of the frequent recipients of courtroom injustice is Randall Terry, the founder of Operation Rescue. On October 5th, 1989, he was sentenced to a $1,000 fine and two years banishment from Atlanta for his part in the rescue mission on July 19th, 1988, during the Democratic National Convention. When he told the judge that he could not in good conscience pay the fine, the judge sentenced him to two years in prison. This interview was taken while he was jailed in a prison work camp. These judges that are doing this to pro-lifers and that are suing us and, and just, they're being tyrants, they are criminals. They are criminals. We have to remember that judges in Germany were tried as criminals after the Holocaust for their part in the Holocaust. And these judges are, are bringing criminal acts against people. Well, it's part of a pattern of local jurisdictions throwing the books at rescuers. In addition to the RICO prosecutions, there are those jurisdictions that have attempted to hold the rescuers liable for the full cost of law enforcement associated with the rescue, something which has never before been contemplated. And it seems to me that all of these ventures are calculated to intimidate, just as the apparent violence would seem to have been calculated to intimidate. Judicial intimidation struck again on October the 4th, 1990, when the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. issued an order threatening donors to Operation Rescue or Randall Terry with personal liability for over $40,000 in past court fines and pro-abortion attorney's fees. This order says that any monetary sanction, any fine or attorney's fees, any order mandating payment of fees imposed by the permanent injunction if not paid within 30 days, on October 4th it said if you don't pay it within 30 days, that it shall be accessible to the extent not paid against any person or organization who pays the bills, wages, fines, or any other monetary obligation of Operation Rescue or Randall Terry. In other words, if someone calls up our office and says, we want to pay your light bill, then they could be held accountable for the $5,000 fine and $42,000 in attorney's fees. If they buy my lunch, they could be found in contempt of this order and be responsible for the $5,000 fine. This is unprecedented in American history that a judge would threaten to go after an organization's donors. He is deliberately trying to drive us into bankruptcy. This judge's order is an affront to free speech and freedom of association, and it's our sincere hope that as this order burns, people's hearts burn with a righteous anger at this type of judicial tyranny. We must not and we shall not keep quiet. We never Church leaders in Buffalo, New York are protesting a chilling federal court order that threatens $10,000 fines to anyone who encourages others to rescue, even if that encouragement was simply in the form of reading certain passages from the Bible. Let me quote to you the words of the uh, attorney for the pro-abortion position who is arguing for this injunction before Judge Artera. This is taken directly from the court transcript. She says, as I understand Reverend Shank's argument, it essentially boils down 
suggested that there might be a higher authority that he feels bound by, namely his interpretation of the scriptural word of God, that he deems to be a higher authority than this order of this court. As I understand his argument, he is saying that the word rescue appears in the Bible. And to him, that might mean blocking ingress or egress from facility. And I would submit that that is not what the word rescue in the Bible means. But that he is certainly free to preach from the pulpit about rescuing unborn children but if they then do that, they are violating this order. In other words, the constitutional right to exercise religion does not include the right to counsel people to take action which is in direct violation of this federal court. This is a constraint on our conscience. Not only do they interpret the order to mean that we cannot advocate from Scripture. This, I should add, ensued after a discussion of the interpretation of Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 11, which commands us to rescue those who are being dragged away to their death. But not only that, but the court also ordered the pastors and those in concert with them to warn all of those that they imagine would be involved in any direct action on behalf of the unborn not to do so. So we are not only ordered what not to say in the pulpit, but we are ordered what to say. The judge is expecting us in signing this order to state certain things to individuals that we do not believe. And therefore we become a mouthpiece against our conscience to say things that the court has ordered us to say. This is a fundamental violation of our freedom of speech. We cannot be constrained to say things that we do not believe. And we cannot be held back from saying things that we do believe. In spite of the secular media cover-up of the police and court atrocities, the Christian media have faithfully reported the truth to the body of Christ. Many believers have responded to the plight of their brothers and sisters trying to protect the civil rights of rescuers. But much has to be done. They can write the judges and the prosecutors. They can picket the judges and the prosecutors' offices, and they can picket their homes. If we see injustice taking place inside the judicial system, inside the courtroom, it is our obligation to speak out. Now, we need to do it properly within the confines of the law, but we need to speak out when we see injustice taking place. It's a right, it's an obligation, it's something we have to do. We don't need to be so intimidated by the judicial system that we sit back and do nothing, because then it's going to be a steamroller rolling over us. What's going to have to happen is that the pace with regard to this question will have to be set by the general public. It is clear that the opinion molders are not going to set the pace. That for whatever reason, they've made a decision. They've come down on one side of this question, and it's not on the side of truth. And therefore, if truth is ever going to see the light of day, it should have to come because the people themselves demand it. While the battle is raging in the streets, the battle is also raging on the political front. The Webster decision has given the pro-life community a crack in the door to work through. But the death activists are entrenched, well-financed, freshly invigorated, and backed by the pro-death secular media. One great challenge before the church is to channel some of her momentum and manpower into political firepower. We have to make up for the money power that they have with shoe leather, the willingness to go door to door, the willingness to communicate to our neighbors, the people in our church congregations, to excite the idea of precinct level politics, going out and spreading this message of you know, the necessity of putting an end to abortion in America. Those who proclaim the name of Jesus, who proclaim you know, truth, who say they know that abortion is the murder of a child, and who do nothing or do very little, therefore I have allowed you know, the, the, the abortion judges, the abortionists, and all the you know, the Namrial people and all those in society that are supporting the killing, that even say, well, yes, it is killing, but it's not that bad. They're saying that because all those people know how bad it is. The vast majority are doing nothing. There is such a, a leadership vacuum in this world today that is being filled by so many people who are not Christians and don't claim to be Christians. 
But the void continues to grow deeper as the problems continue to get larger. And I believe now is the time for the church to rise up and for the church to fill that leadership vacuum and say, hey, we have the answer. But what if the church doesn't fill the leadership void? What if she doesn't repent of her apathy? Can America survive as a nation as we plummet down the path we're on? What tyranny and oppression will our children face in the next generation? The prospect is truly frightening. If someone had stood up in 1959 and said, in 30 years we're going to have 25 million dead children, we're going to have homosexuals parading in the streets and making all kinds of vile things that they refer to as art, uh, we're going to have prayer and Bible kicked out of the school. We're going to have euthanasia and infanticide practiced. We're going to have school officials saying that we should teach our young kids about condoms and anal sex, even in the third grade, uh, that we have a plague of AIDS, this cocaine crisis. I mean, if someone had stood up and said all these things were going to happen, they would have been marked as a lunatic. And if we have come this far in 30 years and we're continuing to plummet down this path of cruelty and moral anarchy, where are we going to be 10 or 20 or 30 years from now? We're only in the beginning stages of this battle. We're just in the very beginning stages. It breaks my heart because the enemy fires a couple of shots over the bow of the great ship of God, the church to see us shrink back into our shell in fear and say we better not be involved anymore in this way because it might cost us something. Let me tell you something tonight. It will cost us something if we don't get involved. It's going to cost us more. And I say, God, please, please turn this nation before it's too late so that when, when my uh, little girl is 20 or 25 and she's married, that she won't look at me and say, Daddy, why didn't you stay when you had the choice? I don't want my daughter enduring forced abortion because of my cowardice now. So I'm just pleading with people to, to wake up for their own kid's sake, for their own kid's sake, while we still have an opportunity. Because otherwise, they're going to bear the brunt, and I believe that, they, that future generations will curse us. Because when we could have stopped this bar barbarism and tyranny, that we chose instead our own comfort.